today. We've got a very exciting lineup today, um, and I am very excited uh, for 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 this for this conversation. Now, maybe just a quick background, and then I'll just say something about the process. Uh, background is that, of course, we have because of COVID um, to emergency remote teaching and learning and assessment. Uh, Dr. Weber reminds me constantly. Uh, and um, also, uh, we had to also adjust in terms of uh, teaching uh, theology um, through this through this new mode. Now, some the colleagues who are on our panel today have been working at it for for many years now, if, if not decades. Um, and and uh, so so in a sense, they they are seasoned. But um, as I was speaking to 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 them, I also realized that. Ayla, your, your, your mic is still on. Uh, if you could just unmute it. Thank you, colleague. Thank you very much. So um, as we were discussing it, we realized that, you know, we can learn from the best practices in teaching theology online, but we can also learn what are the pitfalls, even through our mistakes, uh, we can learn. And often, you know, when we, we've been at it for the last few months, uh, it felt as if it, it, it can be overwhelming, but but we would like to hear from colleagues who've been at, at it for, for, for some time now and, and they will share their experiences. Now, in terms of the process, uh, we will do it the same as, as, as we've been doing it now for, for, the, for last week and, and this week. Uh, each uh, speaker or each guest will have about 10, 15 minutes to, to share um, their experiences, best practices, the pitfalls of teaching theology online. Uh, just just 10, 15 minutes. And uh, then while they're busy, we uh, can, in the chat function, we can just make comments or questions or um, things that you want to add as well, your own experiences over the, over the last uh, six months. Um, perhaps things which resonates with, with, with your own experience. Uh, and while we're busy with it, uh, Dr. Shanto Weber, who is leading our show towards this, this emergency remote learning, will, will keep an eye on the chat function and also gather some of the themes that, that are common, themes that emerge, perhaps takeaways. And, and then after that, we will give her opportunity to also share with us what has been emerging. And then after that, we will just allow the speakers again, maybe just for a one minute or so, uh, just to give us one or two takeaways um, as, 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 we, as we continue our journey. So thanks colleagues for joining. I know, you know it's busy and, and we, will, we wouldn't want to take more of your time than, than needed. So I will, uh, without further ado, start with Professor Paul Gundani. Uh, Professor Paul Gundani is currently the Vice Chancellor of Zimbabwe Open University. Uh, Professor Gudani uh, has been teaching theology for many years. Uh, online, he's been in, in leadership uh, at, at University of South Africa. Uh, he is a professor in church history, uh, but, but currently, as, as I've already indicated, he is the principal of the Zimbabwe Open University. And um, we are privileged to have him with us. Prof. Gudani, thank you uh, for, for your time. And um, we are looking forward to, 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 to your input this, this morning. And then we also have Dr. Joshua John, who is the co-dean at the Oxford Center for Religion and Public Life, one of our partners, especially with postgraduate studies. Uh, Dr. John has been also teaching theology for many years, also through distance, working with many students all over our continent, as well as in the rest of, of the South, uh, in particular, the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and uh, he is also with us. Thank you, Dr. Joshua John, uh, for, for your time. We're looking for your input as well. And then also uh, the third speaker will be Dr. Kubus van Weingart. Um, Dr. van Weingart, um, some of you might know him. Um, he is also teaching uh, for, for many years now theology at UNISA. He's been doing some very innovative stuff. Um, so, so we're looking forward to, uh, to, to, to his input. Without further ado, colleagues, I will give over to Professor Kundani. Um, and uh, Prof Kundani, over to you. You have about 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you, Prof. 
you, you are thank muted. you professor Nen. Yes. thank you thank you very much professor uh, let me preface my uh, my conversation uh, contribution by saying that I'm uh, a hands-off experienced person <laughs> in the sense that I've been in academic <laughs> leadership uh, for, for decades, of course, and uh, I only had uh, hands-on experience, of course, in, the, in between uh, uh, 2016 end of 2016 and 2020, mid 2019, then went back to management at the highest level. Uh, but in the process, uh, what I would want to do is to just um, pick on some important points, of course, as, as, as a member of management, reflecting on some of the work that we have been doing here, uh, with direct bearing on religious studies and theology at, at UNISA as well as at Zimbabwe Open University. First, of course, is to say that um, it is very, very important that um, COVID-19 COVID virus has uh, created for us a chance, an opportunity actually, to revisit our pedagogies uh, and of course, in theology and religious studies, to ascertain the extent to which our pedagogy is in line with the imperative of the 21st century, as well of the as well as of the fourth industrial revolution. It is important that we prepare our students in such ways that uh, they are ready to embrace the challenges and imperatives of the fourth industrial revolution. And in that sense, therefore, I think that for theology, it is a great opportunity for us to embrace online teaching um, because our students, uh, whether they are going into the uh, churches, uh, non-governmental environment or into, into other sectors, they must be ready um, and relevant to the 21st century. And I think it is an imperative, it's an ethical imperative for schools of theology and um, of religious studies to prepare them uh, to embrace the challenges of the revolution and the 21st century. Now, when it comes to uh, the teaching and learning delivery approaches that uh, I have encouraged and I have also collaborated with we have in the last uh, uh, seven or eight uh, months at Zimbabwe Open University been uh, playing around or uh, fiddling around with um, technologies such as Zoom uh, for synchronous and asynchronous delivery of lectures uh, with Microsoft Teams. Uh, and uh, it is quite easy to have group activities under my Microsoft Teams and uh, to have video conferences uh, with our students. We, we have a, a structure that has regions uh, across the 10 provinces of our country. And so our students will be placed in the regions and their regional campuses and therefore video conferencing and go to room is very, very, very important. We have also used uh, other multimedia technologies and web-based uh, uh, technologies um, and WhatsApp for posting to, to just uh, give notices to our students on the work and activities to be done. And our assessment methods have actually changed um, uh, quite drastically. And some of the areas that we have emphasized uh, include uh, uh, having multiple choice questions, at least uh, up to about uh, 20 to 40 percent of, of the exercise, it might be formative or even summative assessment, e-portfolios, um, end of semester papers, uh, quizzes, um, and it is important, uh, Chair, that uh, our academics particularly have to be familiar with the uh, taxonomy theory of assessment so that um, the, 
they can pace the students uh, through uh, the lower order teaching skills or lots, right up to the higher order teaching skills, hot. And of course, we can use, we have been using analytics to monitor our students, the progression and retention of our students, and also providing learning support uh, to at-risk students. That is very, very important so that we are on the same page with our students. And we have also developed non-venue exams, uh, which are written um, again from the campuses with, uh, in some cases, we have just started, started using a biometric pen, uh, um, which translates all that is written onto the computer and then over to the lecturer to start uh, examining and also to the moderator for moderation. That is very, very important. And we are also, we have started working on online oral examinations, especially for master's and doctoral uh, dissertation proposals and examinations, um, where of course uh, we, we use online gadgets, again, uh, virtual interactions, that is. But the re learning resources that we have uh, started using, including, of course, web, web page or sites, uh, e-journals, e-books, uh, e-library, uh, open educational resources to a large extent. Um, in, in, and this is in line with some of the partnerships that we have developed, especially with the uh, uh, open educational resources universities in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, some of you might be aware of that one. And uh, in terms of uh, pedagogical orientation, it is very, very important that we reflect on being student-centered and moving away from a lecturer-centered approach. Now, let me then briefly talk about some of the benefits that I think are, uh, are important for us as theology uh, educators. One, Online teaching and learning creates an opportunity for us as educators and students to leverage on free or open access or open license educational media, such as YouTube, uh, MOOC, and there are many MOOCs that are actually also available, which we can custom our students. Secondly, uh, open online teaching and learning uh, is, is possible uh, to provide teaching and learning anytime, anywhere. And this is what we are doing here as an open university. That's removing the necessity for travel and exposing our students to the risk of contracting the COVID virus. That has been very, very important. And of course, uh, it is important to reflect on the ubiquity of ICTs. Um, there is a big opportunity in the development of learning materials learning services, and also communication between students and staff. And of course, some of the challenges that we have met include the following. First, the lack of readiness from our academic as well as support staff to embrace online teaching because the general tendency has been to use in the case of Zimbabwe Open University, the module and distributing the module. Of course, we have converted it into a soft copy, but the tendency is that the, the approach was the module is the teacher, but online teaching is a way of making sure that you have 24 seven presence. You, you cannot be absent from the student. And that is the beauty of it. It's pedagogical presence throughout the day, interacting, following up with students, and making sure that they have actually met the requirements that we set as academics. That is very, very important. Then uh, lastly, let me talk about um, uh, what has been referred to as the Ion Triangle, uh, which is the triangle consisting of um, aspects such as one, access, two, cost, three, quality. When it comes to access, it is important to reflect on the extent to which online teaching 
creates equity, diversity, and inclusion throughout the cross-section of our student body. When we go online, we want to ensure that the urban, peri-urban, township, and rural students remain where they are, and they are not disadvantaged by their location or economic status uh, or geographical location uh, from accessing education. That's one thing to be very, very careful about. Secondly is the cost, because online teaching brings with it ICT gadgets that some of our students do not necessarily have. Uh, um, these include, uh, include laptops, the iPads or tablets, smartphones that have capacity to engage the online teaching that we, we recommend, uh, the, the smartphone. And of course, in Zimbabwe, the question of cost of data, that is a big, big issue. Then of course, uh, we have to talk about quality. Quality is very, very important. While there is a general tendency to talk about quality of teaching and learning, the underlying assumption for me is that the academic and support staff must be of the right quality. First, are they fit for purpose? Secondly, we must have top of the range ICT architecture, but that also relates to cost. And uh, it is not so easy for us here in terms of cost. Thirdly, when we look at the quality bouquet, uh, it cannot be complete without ongoing research on the scholarship of online teaching and learning. So there is need for academic staff who continuously research what it means to have this online teaching and learning so that uh, as we reflect on the student needs, as we reflect on the changes in technology, as we reflect on the changing learning environment, our research must help us to improve in, to, uh, to improve our repertoire, repertoire of teaching and learning, online te teaching and learning. I think, uh, Chairperson, these are some of my reflections and we are free then to engage. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gudani. There's, there's a bit of an echo here, but uh, I think you've set the scene for us. Um, and uh, we immediately will go to uh, Dr. Joshua John um, and then uh, Dr. Kobus van Weinhardt. And I think that that will just help us to keep the flow and then we will we will come back uh, with, with some questions and comments. So Dr. Joshua John, uh, as indicated, is currently the, the co-dean at the Oxford Center for Religion and the Public Life. Um, and I uh, want to mention also the fact that yesterday, um, a, a new cohort of, of students started with a seminar um, here at, at, with Salambos online. And uh, we are very really, uh, grateful to have Joshua, uh, Dr. Joshua John also with us. Dr. John, over to you. There's, there's a bit of a feedback, but um, let's, let's see if we can fix that. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, can you see yes. my... Yes, we can see the presentation. Right, wonderful. I think i just like to uh, highlight a few things. It's a great privilege for me to speak to you. And also I'm thankful to Professor Reginald, the Dean, for inviting me to share a few of my experience. Uh, though I'm not an expert, I must humble myself. Um, I will highlight from my limited experience a few points. Um, I think these are all old questions which we are asking again uh, in terms of online learning. Am I teaching uh, or are they learning? Uh, it's more, I think, a demand to shift from the content-centered uh, information transfer to learner-centered learning. And if that is the case, uh, we need to ask, uh, who are they? Do I know them? Uh, do I need to know them? Am I joining with them in discovering, knowing, and completing the course? And I think knowing learners personally is important for tutors, even if they are too many or invisible. And also, it's very important. The second point, which I feel very important, is do they feel important? They means learners. 
Are they comfortable in asking difficult questions? I think these are some of those old questions, but I think in terms of online relationship with the tutor and the student, we may have to ask this again. Are they taken seriously by me or by the course content? Um, then we are also asking the questions. Are they allowed to ask less important question? Or do they feel free to ask some idiotic questions? And thereby, they feel seriously about uh, you know being online with you, with us. Changing the teaching pattern uh, style, uh, of course, you know, uh, from dumping to empowering in learning, and it becomes more participatory and interactive. Uh, so we shift from that unidirectional uh, information transfer to interactive learning. Uh, so it becomes uh, user friendly too. And uh, sometimes in theological education, we need to ask, are we moving from knowledge transfer to skills, professional and vocational skills, and to some extent character formation is going to be more difficult because in the residence or in the kind of regular attendance, we can observe and we can engage, uh, including the skills put in place and character being formed. Whereas in the online, we may have to collaborate with the churches and the mentors and uh, possibly we may have to develop a different level of learning, even at PhD or MTH level, we may have to have this supervisor or lecturer and then tutors who can support with other systems in place. And then we also have mentoring, pastoral support. So there are different structure needed even to provide support. And uh, in order to have the character and reflexive way of learning. We also need immersion and immersion-based learning in their context. So this is a few things I just like to start with the learner center. And in the online learning, of course, they learn in their own context and also create a virtual learning community. Um, uh, they uh, it, it recently we realized that making them to prepare beforehand to come for the lecture is better then just come and attend and ask some questions. Because if you give them the paper beforehand, ask particular students to read and participate by uh, you know, responding to the paper, give them five minutes. So there are a number of students who were doing this. They really liked it in a sense. They read the paper beforehand and they prepared themselves for response and they were part of the presentation. So it made the whole student body involved and in creating that virtual learning community. And also it gives a paradigm shift in learning, taking theological education to them in an asynchronous learning. It's a multiple ways, you know, you need to make sure, of course, it's a technological side of even the mobile phone or any other ways they, they can engage and join us. And we have used, uh, Telegram and uh, we have a WhatsApp group and uh, all sorts of things to engage. Because in the normal learning process in the classroom based, we, many students learn during the coffee time, lunch break, but now every, every side of learning to be taken into this whole process. And uh, we also have to identify the pedagogical hermeneutics because sometimes audio, video, uh, text and all, and I think we cannot use in the old style. We have to find a new imaginative, creative, and aesthetic ways of using these forms and technologies, uh, which is uh, making the teacher as a multitask at times. But if you prepare first time, it would be easier for the second time. And the new method has come, which is called self-directed learning. Um, how do we enable the students learn by themselves, set their own learning outcomes, and how they are capable and they can recognize their limitations and strengths in what way they can complete reaching uh, the learning outcomes by themselves. And then we journey with them. That is a very interesting new model, self-directed learning in the online courses. And then we also have peer-initiated learning. How do we form groups among themselves so that they can support each other and learn together? And uh, this is a new world of learning, which we are discussing, of course, uh, you know, monitoring, of course, quality control and uh, reaching learning outcomes. Because 
sometimes we seem to deliver lectures. Yes, I have done that, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, only two, three people complete the course and we are actually disappointed. So we need to make sure that they are part of the whole learning process. And of course, as theologians, we also work towards formation, which needs collaboration with the local mentors, such as the experienced priests or those who have got some uh, learning experience in the local context where they are living. But of course, again, I would like to highlight the creative tension uh, between the um, knowledge transfer uh, skills and uh, the formation. Um, I like to, you know, highlight what are the difficulties that we also have. Some are highly sophisticated tech-wise, language and education-wise. Uh, some students are technophobic and uh, they are very much book-based and printed-based. Now online learning scares them out. So how do we come up with the mentoring there? There's a bit of support, pastoral support needed besides the lecturing and other things. So we need to organize, or we have to change the roles at times. Um, and also there are people techno marginalized. There are questions about accessibility of the technology, availability of the net and affordability to buy. So how much we can be inclusive? That's a question uh, we have to ask, uh, though it is not sometime our business, but I think still, it's important. And some students are dyslexic and uh, and slow learners, slow downloaders, and the age differences, and how these technological constraints that we can try to support in a way that can help them in the learning process, which are new challenges, of course. Uh, of course, besides tutoring, there must be mentoring and coaching that I have already said. But usually the public perception is that you know, online learning is very less quality. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind strongly, maintain the high quality uh, learning input that we need to keep. And uh, and the learning outcomes should be very clear. And, uh, you know, all the other things I don't want to repeat again, but I just like to go again to some of these uh, problems that we face. Students do not attend Zoom seminar. Uh, so when we use WhatsApp, we sometimes wake them up and ask them, come on, you attend the Zoom now. So I, I think some of our administrators help and uh, through all these networks, Facebook and others, and uh, so that they can come on board. Uh, it's important that they attend regularly. And once that learning atmosphere is created and the community of learners created, then they start attending regularly. Technology not working, and I think sometimes we try to shift between different technologies so that it works for students. And even connecting via phone, uh, even Zoom and uh, Google Meet and uh, Microsoft Team has that connecting uh, through my uh, telephone. So sometimes it's a kind of other supports, you know, available through language support and uh, large numbers and all this to be part of the whole online learning system, um, uh, particularly uh, for the students who are far away from us. And uh, it's also important that, you know, quality, of course, I have talked about it, examinations, at the end of the day, students have to meet the high quality and the standard that we set. And I think the students begin to understand as they engage with us online, and we slowly move towards it. And uh, I think uh, mentoring and tutoring, besides lecturing, helps them to move towards it. And we sometimes have to work extra mile in some students' cases uh, who fall behind to make sure that they meet uh, that uh, expected quality and standard. But sometimes it's a very difficult thing nowadays in the, in the uh, Global South context that plagiarism is a really an issue. And it's, make, it's very difficult to make them understand in the online learning, uh, particularly when they come up with their assignments, that this is not acceptable at all. And uh, it's very difficult. They come up with one or the other reason, and no, there's no way to get uh, through that. And then, you know, that, that's the kind of thing I just like to highlight. And I think uh, a few uh, models that I, uh, you know, follow is, uh, as you already know, these uh, people, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing I like to highlight learning in relations with Mikhail Batin. And uh, I'm very much uh, Kerke Guardian and bringing out meanings within. So if we have this paradigm shift in the online learning, 
I think we are very creative and also journey with students in discovering the truth and God and uh, and the life purpose. And that is the theological education, I suppose. And I think uh, with that note, I will stop within the 10 minutes that I am given. And uh, I think I think you can ask me some questions. Wonderful. No, thank you, Dr. John, and thank you for 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 you know the the, the I think uh, in terms of time specific the, the 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 comments that you made, but also um, for for helping us to keep within our time. Um, we will come back. We will come back. conversations. Yesterday we just had a program committee meeting on teaching and learning, and one of the key issues is what you raised, the issue of plagiarism and and ethics with with within this space, especially as theologians. So um, let, let me move to the to the last uh, speaker, uh, Kubus uh, van Weingart. Uh, and um, as I indicated, Kubus ha is uh, currently a lecturer at, at UNISA in uh, systematic theology. And uh, some of you know Kubus, but uh, I think Kubus has been at it for some years. So so in a sense, you know, we would love to hear you know those best practices, but also. And, and some of his experiences over the last few years. So, Kobus, over to you. It's good to, to have you with us. Uh, thank you, Reggie, and thank you for the invitation. I'm having a little bit of internet trouble on upload speed, so I hope this uh, screen share is going to hold. If not, I'm just going to stop that and continue audio only, if that is not a problem. Uh, let me start with a bit of a confession. As we move through April and May of this year, I often heard colleagues from other universities mention something along the lines of how prepared UNISA must have been for a situation like this. And, and I personally never knew how to respond. I mean, indeed, in some things, I think it were easier for those of us working from an open distance learning environment. But mostly, I suspect that the explosion in conversations around online and distance learning, to a large extent, exposed the fact that we too have a lot of work to do. So. I, I honestly and with any, without any sense of false humility want to say that I believe that we are in this together. But I'm also grateful for the opportunity to share something of what we may have learned from our context. What I want to do today is to reflect somewhat personally on the kinds of shifts in thinking that was required for uh, myself coming from a, a residential campus, that was where I was formed, moving into an open distance learning environment. But I also want to speak of teaching theology quite specifically, and then I'll conclude with what I consider to be some important lessons learned, and specifically matters on which I suspect we need to push against the popular consensus as it emerged since March of this year. So just a note of warning, I speak from a context of permanent and exclusive online and distance education, and some of this may not be relevant for the kind of temporary online stints that many of us have been drawn into over the past months. But perhaps our having this conversation in October of 2020 is also a reminder that this is not going to be temporary. I love my student days. For five years in university residence, I skipped many 7.30 classes in junior years, and I came late for many others in senior years. But I love the debate, the battle of wits and words, the hours spent after class with friends who were also theological sparring partners, with vastly different perspectives than mine. I spent countless hours just reading through the covers of books in the library, and sometimes I read the books as well. Uh, countless more in the intricacies of student politics and a third part drawn up in the congregational life of the local student congregation. I can never imagine my life today without those formative years made possible through the privilege of full-time residential education. On the other hand, I entered the world of online distance learning by accident. In fact, the distance embedded, it, it was probably nothing more than an afterthought, and it took a few years to become a matter of conscious reflection. Now, it's been said repeatedly, but repetition and reflection are warranted in this conversation, that the biggest mistake of teaching online is the attempt to reproduce the classroom. After decades in this mode, I cannot guarantee that my own institution, UNISA, has been able to step out of this trap. I'm going to return to this repeatedly in the coming few minutes. The greatest pitfall is perhaps our attempt at reproducing the classroom in online education. Far too often our conversations on distance or online teaching take the form of assuming that the classroom that formed us is indeed the romantic ideal that remains, unfortunately out of reach in a distance and online context. Yet that our task is to re reproduce it as best possible. 
In the process, we miss both the impossibility and the opportunity to reflect on its desirability in the process. Its extreme version is found in the fairly low-budget single camera that records the talking head as it blabbers for an hour of lecture, forgetting that the value of the lecture was exactly in its interruptions. Indeed, its reproduction in this way is impossible. But also that the lecture often was far less value than we pretend. So the desirability of the reproduction is in itself, is in itself in question. So here is perhaps the first point where I want to go. What happens when Tani Sunny, who taught me that Jesus loved me back in Sunday school, is not just a distant idea that I can apply my new found theological critique onto my mind, but if she is indeed the Tani Sunny that still keeps the benches after a local congregation, that is still my local congregation warm, or that confronts me down at the local spa for starting to skip in church now that I'm studying theology, how does that change the picture? You see, there's an opportunity embedded in theological education and formation at a distance that we need to explore. Our students are not forced to break with their communities of origin. Their conversation partners in their theological journeys are not their fellow ad adolescents trying to get one up on one another in the next theological debate, but rather remain that community of faith and life that formed them, sustained them, or that threatened them and undermined them. Accompanying students in that journey imply more than just a change of format. It forces us to hear different questions, guides students to ask different questions, but most of all, it is an immense opportunity to guide theology students to be doing theology, not from the island of academic campuses, but from the trenches of every community everywhere. But if the knee-jerk assumptions were that the classroom can be duplicated online and Sunday morning can be duplicated online, I suspect there's much greater awareness that our practices of long-term formation cannot that easily find expression on Zoom. Somewhere the nagging suspicion reminds that life together cannot be achieved by Facebook pro proxy. I don't know what a such a formation will look like if the future of theological education happens to be online for a growing number of students. I do, however, suspect that this is where the real challenge will be found. Perhaps it will involve spiritual guidance at a distance, perhaps moments of gathering, the short-term retreat being this, the model to fall back on, but in line with what was said so far, I do wonder if the shift to online learning should not also be accompanied by a shift to decentralized formation for the theological education. It would imply that the church more broadly becomes drawn into the process of formation of theological students. So with that, a few best practices and pitfalls. From the above, I want to speak directly to the theme by laying down my own list of principles which speak to the best practices and worst pitfalls, or at least some of them. They may or may not be relevant to the future of Stellenbosch University, and that depends on the choices made in the coming months. One, your diary is not your student's diary. Obviously, academic life is notorious for ignoring office hours. I suspect my own university is not unique in the amount of emails that have been flying back and forth between colleagues after 10 p.m. and into the early hours of the morning. I'll leave the question of the desirability of such a work culture for another day. For now, it is what it is. But our teaching imagination still run largely around the 8 to 5 day. But that's not when our students are able to log on. They are working jobs, raising kids, running churches, and studying as well. So the open in our open distance e-learning at UNISA in part emphasizes that learning environments must be put together in such a way that students can create and find their own rhythms. Again, don't try and reproduce the classroom. So best practice should be the creation of learning journeys, which allow students to participate within their own schedules and times. To put it more technically, up for low immediacy whenever possible. Two, video is not key. Zoom quickly became synonymous with virtual me meetings in the early lockdown. And I guess in the same way that we may be Googling on you, a Yahoo search engine, we may well be Zooming on Microsoft Teams. Within days or weeks, the assumption grew that video is key. The obvious route for online learning seemingly being the talking head speaking live. There are advantages to video, but I have my doubts whether this should become the main medium of online learning. Text is searchable, knowing data allows students to easily slow down and digest what isn't immediately clear. I suspect best practice should be a constant consideration of what the best medium would be for a particular point, with a constant call for lower tech and data consumption. To put it more technically, up for low bandwidth whenever it's possible. Three, online teaching can disrupt inequality both.
I do think online teaching can disrupt the inequality which the largely inaccessible model of higher education currently reproduces. Just go back and look at the school quintiles of your student body before becoming defensive. We are part of the problem. We remain a project in class formation. Educational models that doesn't require residence is in some of the most expensive parts of the country and which allow for ongoing economic activity while study, studying surely has some potential in opening up education. However, it also risks disrupting attempts at equalization, where campus provided the same broadband internet connection to all and could at least attempt safe and secure accommodation for all. Connectivity now relies not only on avail availability of data, but also on the quality of the internet backbones and the inequalities of society remain within sight and smell and constantly audible or else found in the in invisible privilege of a silent study room. And that remains throughout the study process now. So let's remain sensitive to this ambiguity. Four, student community remains key. A senior colleague told me as a young lecturer that students learn from three, three places, good literature, each other, and good lecturers in that order. Your task is first to guide students towards good literature and each other, and your own contribution comes after that. I suspect we may argue the order and the weighting and name the exception to this, but many of us can also recognize the truth of this in our own formation. But it's easy to forget this in online learning. Perhaps the greatest advantage of the university campus is the effortless way in which young adolescent minds are thrown together and in between party protests, sex and politics also debate ideas in the corridors outside classrooms or deep into the night. Online teaching will have to be to more consciously do the work of forming community among peers or perhaps more specifically provide students with the resources and power to form our learning space into one which will facilitate their collective formation. And then my fifth one, understanding your context, your understanding your students is work. So lastly, in the same way that conscious labor is required to facilitate what the forced joining of bodies on a university campus often does among students, there is work to be done in understanding our students. Although we probably overestimate how well we really understand our students under any circumstances, it is very easy to reduce them to an anonymous and faceless crowd when they study at a distance. So combining the importance of understanding our students with the commitment to respecting the boundaries they lay down and how much they want us to know their personal context will create even further layers of work. We must remember that students have the right not to have you peep into their living spaces via online video feeds and that when collecting information on our students, there is a line between understanding students and policing students that should always be noted. In this age of consent, this should be extended to our joining with students' lives. So I'll conclude. The list is not conclusive. The thoughts are still finding words, but I know this. 2020 was a great year for those selling educational technology. We may never, never allow corporate technologists to determine pedagogic best practice, least of all for the future of theological formation. I'm no less convinced than anyone else that online learning will be an increasingly important aspect of our lives, but I also fear that we are standing at a precipice of our own making and uncritically buying into the tools of the next American billionaire will be disastrous for all, but be particularly disastrous in our linguistically and culturally diverse and economically vastly unequal society. So our movement towards teaching theology online will, as with so many things, require both innovation and resistance. Discerning the relation between these is perhaps the key task of the present. Ah, Corbus, thank you. Um, and, and thanks thanks to the colleagues. Uh, you know, everyone, uh, you've, you've really set the table for us. Um, and and we, are, we are very excited. You've challenged us, you've stretched us. And, and yes, there was a bit of humility in, in how you presented yourselves, but but I think I think it was valuable. I, I found it fascinating. Gobis, your screen is still on. So um, can can I can I ask uh, Dr. Shanto Weber to 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 she she is sort of on a on a mobile connection. So I'm going to immediately put uh, put a uh, you know um, uh, you know to to speak. But but while she's sort of unmuting. Um, I just want to say thank you also for our support staff who are here. I, I just noticed many of our support staff are here, our, our administrators, uh, Hela from, from the library. And, and I think this is an important, uh, like I said last week, a community of practice 
where you, where you start to, to think differently and, and colleagues you are challenging us. Uh, our tutors also who, who have joined us, it's it's wonderful to, to, to see you here present. So uh, Chantal Weber, over to you. Thanks, Dean, and thanks to everybody. Uh, just to kind of mark when I'm done, Dean, that um, our colleague Peter Nagel's hands up, so he has a question. But just to kind of highlight some of the key areas from the different colleagues, it seems that there is a constant, even now connecting to last week's uh, session, this constant reminder of the importance of institutional collaboration. Uh, colleagues speak about the networks they have with other institutions to make access or technology possible for for students. So that seems to be coming through from last week and again two speakers today. Um, and then overall, all the speakers seem to speak to the importance of equipping faculty uh, and staff. Um, so not just in terms of preparing for online technology, uh, but also just what this means, like we're doing now in terms of online teaching, in terms of building relationship. And of course, now um, Quibus spoke also about what does relationship within a theological faculty being online look like, but also the importance of equipping faculty with the necessary tools. Uh, you know, there's been various modalities mentioned today, MS Teams, the different e resources and apps, uh, the whole importance of staff understanding the importance of even with the learner centeredness, having moments of immersion for students to kind of engage with. So this all speaks to me about how we prepare and equip our colleagues in terms of uh, teaching staff, but also administration staff. And I think the, the last key thread that comes through all the speakers and highlighted even more in the last one now was the importance of also planning properly. I think we could learn from this even in our stint this year uh, for student support uh, and that's technological support. Uh, but even uh, Dr. Joshua spoke about the importance of language, you know, what language looks like. But also one of the things that I highlight from his talk um, is the technophobia that students may have, not because they're lazy or not because of access, but actually one of the things we didn't take into consideration, or at least I didn't, is learning um, difficulties that students have or obstacles to learning like dyslexia. So what does that then do to a student having to go online? Um, all the speakers spoke about the importance of postural, but also psychosocial support. And of course, highlighted quite a bit in this last talk, the importance of how we continue to spiritually form or create opportunities for spiritual formation for our students because we are a theology faculty and we do want to embrace relationship and support in a different way. The questions, of course, of how we can do that. Uh, it is also important, just lastly, to, to see the connections from Prof Kundani's lecture to scholarship uh, and how we develop scholarship even in this uh, sense on what online teaching means, what hybrid learning means, uh, and that connects also to our recent call just for the external colleagues uh, to become part of the scholarship of educational leadership, which Stellenbosch hosts. So that was also a connection point. So Dean, that just summarizes the three points, importance of institutional collaboration, importance of equipping faculty and staff, and the importance of student support on the various levels. Thank you. Mm, absolutely. And the issue of uh, community mm -hmm. né, relationships, um, I think I think that that's also crucial. Uh, sorry, Peter, I, I didn't see your hand, but uh, over to you uh, or any other colleagues that that want to maybe make a contribution or ask questions to the specific speakers. Peter Nagel, you are first. Yes. Thank you, Dean. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, just a disclaimer that I'm obviously a a, um, a faithful disciple of open source uh, technology, so I have to just put it out there. My, I am, I'm curious, uh, uh, but simultaneously, uh, uh, you know. Uh, you know, confused uh, why uh, 
it seems to me, at least from my point of view, that uh, higher education institutions in Southern Africa and on this continent has not yet uh, um, embraced uh, open source. Uh, the, the, the big names, the Microsoft, the Googles, the Facebooks, and of course, Zooms, uh, the, the, the highly capitalized commercial uh, 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 platforms have been adopted. And I'm wondering whether uh, this is not actually perpetuating inequality. Uh, and I'm not suggesting here that open source is the um, the only way in which or through which one could address inequality and accessibility. But I definitely would want to believe that it's worth a try. And and, uh, uh, and furthermore, I'm 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 wondering whether we can talk about teacher orientated or student orientated. If an institution opts for a certain uh, technology, be it Microsoft Teams, be it Zoom, um, it actually determines curriculum forming, uh, planning, etc. And that in itself enslaves uh, or would at least have the potential of enslaving lecturers, students uh, in, in years to come, decades to come. Uh, uh, because it opts for a certain platform that is uh, funded in a very specific way. So I just want a response from the contributors. Uh, why open source has not been embraced to the extent at least that I would want to see it happen. Uh, um, I genuinely believe that it could assist and contribute to accessibility and eradicate or address inequality in the virtual uh, environments, teaching and learning environments. Thanks, uh, Dean. No, thank you, Peter. Uh, colleagues, you can hear Peter is very passionate about, about open source, and I think it's an important question. <clears throat> and it also relates to, to the question about low data or low tick or low bandwidth uh, 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 solutions um, in, our, in our continent, in our, in our continent. How, how do we uh, uh, make use of that and, and linking that also to the comment by Prof Gundani right at the beginning uh, that we are in an environment, uh, you know, and we preparing students for an environment of what people often call the fourth industrial revolution, which uh, this this is the language that, that students will have to, to speak in a way. But I would like to hear what, what, what our panelists are saying about that. Colleagues, unfortunately, I cannot see if your hand is up. So if there are any more questions, please just unmute your mic and then you may go ahead. I want to maybe just give an opportunity if there are some other contributions as well. If there are none, then I will. Yes, Dr. Weaver. No, I'm just saying no hands up. OK, no, thank you very much. So colleagues, I'm going to give our speakers um, in the same uh, order again an opportunity maybe to respond to some uh, of the, uh, you know, the way that, that uh, Dr. Weber, the, the takeaways, uh, but but then also the question posed by by Dr. Uh, Peter Nagel. Um, and, and if you could just give us that one or two takeaways from from your own experience, uh, that that would be valuable. Just just maybe in one or two minutes. Uh, we will start with Professor Paul Gundani. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I agree with uh, the sentiment raised. Uh, I think that uh, there has been what I call a, a kind of epistemic captivity. Um, and I think Cobas does raise the, the issue even for UNISA. And I say the same about Zimbabwe Open University. There is that tendency also to be uh, to have a phobia for new things, for novelty. And and open source is definitely available. We have uh, used it here at the Zimbabwe Open University, um, not not uh, uh, in as fast a way as as I would like. But uh, for instance, if I I I make reference to Moodle. The, the importance of Moodle. It, it has been the hub 
of our teaching and learning model, uh, model here because it is amenable to customization and we have customized it uh, because it is an open source uh, technology and um, the, through customization we can achieve some of our, our, our objectives as an African uh, university in Zimbabwe. And uh, of course, this should be related also to, to open license um, um, uh, resources associated with uh, open educational resources. But of course, um, while I agree that it is very, very important uh, in, in then creating a situation where you do not decide uh, for the students by adopting Zoom or you adopt uh, Microsoft Teams or you, you adopt um, whatever other alternative. There is a general fear or yes, let me say fear also or cautiousness that whatever the case, even open, open source uh, um, materials, they, 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 they tend to be, uh, in, in a way, let me say, uh, I, I, I don't want to say Eurocentric, I, I want to say North Atlantic dependent uh, to the extent that they, they raise this question about uh, uh, some kind of epistemic colonization, if I may say. So there is some uh, cautiousness to, to just embrace without really understand why open source is open source. W what is the hidden agenda of the open source? Uh, where is, what is the room for us to engage equally as partners in its creation and not just in its embrace? That's, that's, that's certainly one of the issues that I, I, I'm throwing onto the panel to reflect on. Thank you, Professor Thank you, Dali. Dali. Uh, uh, Dr. Joshua John? Yes, I think um, I, I my, the, my previous uh, Professor has said it all, and I, I think the property voice which your professor raised about open source uh, should be kept in mind, though it is not within our decision making, is a bigger kind of institutional and uh, you know other decisions they are made. But I think we should keep pushing it. Uh, that's a that's a good uh, uh, alternative prophetic uh, imagination that we should push that as theological educators. Uh, as an alternative and also even we should foresee a future African alternative of the software that can provide a platform for us that could also be in our imagination but I think for me I like to highlight two two three things which we can think about uh, learning anytime anywhere that's one thing very important learning anytime anywhere uh, it's uh, it should be taken into our account and how that can be to meet the quality that we want to uh, raise up to. And uh, also theological education to the whole people of God. It's not why we limit only to you know, registered students and also for others who can audit and pay for the courses, which may increase our revenue, as well as uh, the whole people of God who may want to know what is going on in specific courses. And that's quite interesting to know. So for me, accessibility and affordability and uh, availability of the technology and learning process are very important, but somehow how we can support it as university, as non-governmental, as well as the faith-based organization. We are keen actually to also explore how uh, cheap ways we can enhance the internet access to those students who cannot access. We are keen to engage in those lines so we can explore that, uh, you know, possibilities of uh, is that something that we can explore together where uh, at a reasonable cheap price that we can enhance the reception of the students in some ways where this accessibility is under question. So that's uh, my point. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joshua John. And I mean, you, you're suggesting concrete ways in which we can take it further, the, the, the challenge that, that uh, Dr. Nago, Peter Nago raised. 
Kubis, you have the last word, um, and um, uh, over to you. I'll, I'll try and keep it under a minute. Uh, so, so three brief comments. One, I hear the comments around for fourth industrial revolution. My brief response is just to say, let's remember that low data is not low tech. Uh, these are not the same things we can we, we, we can embrace in innovation while still remaining very sensitive to data limitations. Two, on, on the open, open source, uh, Peter, I, I was looking for the, the Zoom clap button because I wanted to clap while you were speaking. Uh, absolutely. Uh, from a UNISO context, we were working with Sakai for many years now. Mm. I can say that it is complicated. Um, open source, the open source tools doesn't always perfectly fit our needs. The, the embeddedness within the North Atlantic was already mentioned. Our universities are often, uh, and particularly with the UNISA, but not only with UNISA, our universities are bigger than what these developments were developed for. So if we are going that route, we require very strong uh, IT support departments to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And their collaboration amongst global self universities that say, what are these particular challenges? will actually uh, assist the process. But, but absolutely, I think that is a key component that we, that we need, to, uh, need to keep to. You've heard my, um, my last comments and my conclusion. I am concerned about the sellout that is happening. Mm. And I'll stop mm. there. Okay. So, so Kubus, uh, in a sense, uh, stopped at a very prophetic note. Um, but but I think I think in a sense it summarized a lot of the conversations that while we are excited and we need to explore uh, you know the possibilities and the opportunities. We also need to be critical as as theologians even and ask those difficult and critical questions of uh, things um, you know comments or this understanding of the world as as uh, you know um, often being projected um, from from particular spaces. So. I want to thank all the speakers. That, thank you, Dr. Weber. I want to thank Professor Gundani, the, the Vice Chancellor at the Zimbabwe Open University. We want to stay in touch with you. I want to thank uh, Dr. Joshua John from the Oxford Center for Religion and Public Life. We are in partnership with you. Thank you for your contribution. Um, you uh, also represent the Barnabas Fund. And for the role that you are playing, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kobus van Weingart, um, you, you left us with a lot of things to think about, uh, but I think uh, one of the things that we want to say is that we want to continue the potential that, that is in these collaborations. Colleagues, thank you for your time. It is lunchtime now, and uh, we appreciate the fact that you have spent our time and uh, let us continue the conversations. Uh, next week we have a different team, different episode, and we are looking forward to, to that. Thank you, colleagues, Professor Gundani. Uh, Dr. Joshua John and uh, Dr. Kobus van Weingart, thank you for your time and, and colleagues, all the best and have a wonderful day further.